Shafia Rahman is a freelance London-based documentary filmmaker. He has filmed in a wide variety of contexts and countries, taking on projects from corporate, governmental and non-governmental organisations. His personal projects revolve around themes of human rights, poverty and migration. Most recently, he spent time on the Bangladesh-Myanmar border, filming a documentary about the Rohingya massacre. Your independent projects revolve largely around human rights issues. At what point did you realise that the crisis in Myanmar was something you wanted to make a documentary about? Uh, it was entirely unplanned. I went to that area in December of 2016, uh, purely to see what was going on. What I heard, what I saw, uh, what I experienced there convinced me that I had to do something. And that's why I went back and um, started filming in January of 2017. Um, so it was entirely unplanned. It was motivated by uh, the horrendous things that I saw and heard. Um, the documentary focused on the perpetuation of sexual violence by Myanmar security forces against um, women and young girls. We personally found it very difficult to watch. What effect did filming it have on you? You know, um, we were outside a hut and I was interviewing this woman who had lost her 12 year old. The 12 year old had been slaughtered in front of her. Someone emerged from the hut and said, an NGO worker and said, look, I've been hearing your questions. Would you please come in afterwards? I didn't know what this was about. So I went in afterwards and um, there were these group of about 20 people, 20 young women who had been uh, raped. She had, she asked them, um, tell him how many of you have been raped, about one or two hands went up. She repeated the question, how many, show him, tell him, because he's a journalist, how many of you have been raped? And then they all stood up. It was quite a horrendous, uh, I mean, it was, a, it was a very difficult moment for us. And when we actually spoke to them, and the two youngest spoke to us, one was 14 year old, one was 17 year old. Um, Remember, I don't understand uh, Rohingya 100%. I understand perhaps about 40% now. At one point, I turned to my fixer who was translating because he wasn't saying anything. And I realized why. He had choked up. He just couldn't carry on the interview. So, absolutely. And when I came back to England, I actually spoke to a clinical psychologist because I, I said to him, look, I'm going to be following these people for six months. How do I prevent myself be, from becoming traumatized? And how do I prevent traumatizing these women by asking them questions? So, she, so he gave me some pointers and so on. Um, what do you want people to take away from it? The small uh, documentary that you're referring to, I think it was one of the first to publicize what was happening. This gender-based sexual violence, rape, um, uh, that was being carried out as an act of war against the Rohingya. It's sad to remember that Aung San Suu Kyi herself made the comment that the Burmese army are responsible for acts of rape and they use it as a tactic of war. Unfortunately now, this is the same Aung San Suu Kyi who has on our website that all these rapes are fake rapes. Um, so I want people to take away uh, the fact that um, there is genocide happening and that rape is, uh, is, is part and parcel of that. What do you think about the praise Aung San Suu Kyi has received from the Western media when she's still an unknown quantity and remains largely silent? You know, in the past, she was the great hope, wasn't she? Um, there was military rule and uh, here she was, Western educated, connected to a Western academic. Um, she was a great hope. But I think many people who knew her even at that time realized that uh, she was very much a nationalist. She was very much uh, um, someone who, uh, as you say, was an unknown quantity. But no one could have imagined how brazenly uh, she has behaved um, since uh, the start of the crisis. She lives in denial. And as um, the US congressman has recently said, She's living in a bubble, she's living in a cocoon, misadvised, hasn't got any idea of what's happening. That's why she could just fly off the handle at him to the point that he thought she might attack him. Um, so it takes, you know, quite something for 
someone to turn like this. Well, I suggest she didn't turn. She was always like this. Um, and the Rohingya were never going to be in her you know, uh, agenda. Um, so the UN has called the Myanmar crisis a textbook example of an ethic, ethnic cleansing. How would you characterize the events? You know, um, ethnic cleansing is a term which doesn't really uh, sum up what's been happening. It suggests that um, the Burmese army have been clearing people of the land. And that's certainly true. But if you go back in history, if you look at what's been happening since you know, um, the 70s and even earlier, slowly but surely, these people are losing one right after the other. Slowly but surely, um, an institutional milieu is being created where effectively apartheid is operating. After 2012, many of these people were herded into camps. Many of the Rohingya were herded into, uh, into IDP camps. The conditions there are horrendous. They don't have access to medicines. They can't work. They don't, they don't get education. So what is this? And there are you know, land confiscations. There's forced labor. There's ma difficulty in, uh, if you want to get married. So all these routine kind of day-to-day -day difficulties and these episodic um, uh, uh, examples of uh, horrendous violence show that this is more than ethnic cleansing. This is genocide. The Rohingya are set to be repatriated to Myanmar transit camp. This is not the first time they've been forcefully repatriated to Myanmar. Do you think this deal is premature or dangerous? Thankfully, they haven't been repatriated yet. You're absolutely right. Um, in the past, they have been forcibly repatriated. Uh, much to the shame of the Bangladesh, previous Bangladesh governments, uh, in 1978, uh, Bangladesh government restricted food rations to the camps, resulting in thousands of people dying. 1991, 1992, 1993, there were forced repatriations. And it's to the immense discredit of the UNHCR that they didn't take a more of an oversight in those years, allowing people to be forcibly repatriated. Um, they've learned from that, and I think the uh, UNHCR's head has made uh, comments to that effect, which means that you know, the conditions simply aren't there for safe repatriation. They don't have citizenship, and all these apartheid laws, all these discriminatory laws still apply. And what are you sending them back to? Given the brazen denials of the military that they weren't involved, that they didn't kill anyone, they only killed about 10 people. Given these complete denials, given these, you know, these are examples of fake news, um, how can you possibly uh, entertain the idea of returning them? To me, it's, uh, it's disgraceful. What course forward do you think is in the best interest of the Rohingya people? The best way forward would for them to have their rights restored, for them to be given citizenship, for them to be accepted back where they want to go. The, uh, the Rohingya that I've talked to, they said, look, give me five years worth of aid right now, I'd reject it. I would rather go back to my country, but not if they're going to slaughter me, not if they're going to slaughter my children. In the absence of these rights, Bangladesh should make conditions acceptable for them. They don't have refugee status. They're not allowed to work. They're not allowed to spread anywhere. They've been concentrated in camps. There are ideas, you know, perhaps you can make a special uh, zone for these people so they can work with uh, locals and um, develop some livelihood strategies. Bangladesh needs to think more progressively about what to do with this uh, huge numbers of refugees. Um, we can draw parallels with other genocides in Rwanda, in Bosnia, and each time the international community says, like, we will never let this happen again. Why are countries so hesitant to label genocides as such? Is it intentional to relieve an obligation to intervene? I think you're absolutely right. As soon as you use the word genocide, uh, certain moral and political obligations fall on the uh, uh, member states um, to behave accordingly. They have to take a UN Security Council resolution, uh, which of course will be vetoed by certain countries, possibly Russia and China. Um, and then, of course, there's the hurdle of Myanmar ac accepting a dream uh, which needs to investigate the genocide. So they'd rather not be bothered. 
Rohingya are just simply uh, poor people who are in the way. We don't really need to solve them. Hopefully, they will just go away. This is how you know, almost a million people are being treated with such contempt. Um, what do you think it would take, if anything, to force the global community into action? That's a very, very difficult question. Obviously, uh, with all the news that's been happening, with all the television networks, the place is awash with cameras and lenses. And yet, you have um, countries not really uh, coming to the fore and insisting that Myanmar uh, restore their res re citizenship, restore their rights. You have to wonder why this is. Um, why is Myanmar so important that they have to kind of um, be so sensitive to its needs? It's possibly because uh, Myanmar is of great geopolitical uh, significance. Uh, China has huge investments there. Um, I think uh, it, it's an indicator of how important it is that President Obama um, visited Myanmar. So it's not, it's not a regular thing that the president of the USA visits any old country. Uh, so it's a very, very significant country. And I think the geopolitics of it are such that people are simply not willing to rock the boat. Thank you. Thank you.